Well, hello there, everyone. We're talking this week about the Deuteronomic Covenant, and I wanted to take a moment to discuss with you the different kinds of covenants. We've already really seen two kinds of covenants so far. The first we looked at with Abraham, which I mentioned in the uh, key terms of that week that that was a grant covenant. And this covenant that we're looking at this week, the Deuteronomic covenant, is what's called a suzerain vassal covenant or a suzerain vassal treaty. Uh, what is a suzerain vassal treaty? Well, first of all, what's a suzerain? Uh, that's a word that you may not know. A suzerain is basically an overlord. Um, it, it is a, a powerful ruler who is in effect ruling over other rulers. A vassal is a ruler only in a kind of a derived sense, you know, managing over his little personal fiefdom, which is only a small part of the suzerain's realm. The vassal is in effect a, a complete subordinate. So how does a suzerain vassal agreement or treaty or covenant work? Uh, basically, the idea is this. The suzerain being the most powerful ruler in uh, a given region will basically approach the vassal and, you know, talk to him like Pauly on The Sopranos. You know, it, it's a nice little kingdom you got here. It'd be a shame if something happened to it. And so what they do is they, in effect, lean on the vassal to in effect say, okay, well, we'll let you stay in power here. Um, we'll leave you alone. We'll, of course, protect you from other outside, you know, invasion forces or, or threats. And, and there may be these too, because let's face it, in the ancient Near East, it's, it's a rough and tumble world. But you're going to have to, in effect, now pay us protection money for this. And this protection is, is called tribute. So, you know, it's, it's going to be a percentage of your royal taxation or your royal assets or you know whatever is is agreed upon and in exchange for that we're going to leave you in control and we'll let you basically run your kingdom at a day-to-day -day level the way that you want to do it uh, with the understanding that, that you're in effect now working for us you're you're now part of our larger protectorate and we expect you to uh, to pay for the privilege of that now and of course in reality the, the protection is really from the suzerain as much as it is from other enemies. And so that this is why it's, it's, it's not a particularly amicable or friendly relationship. Uh, it's, it's really more one imposed by force. Uh, the suzerain will do this, by the way, because the suzerain knows it's a bit of a pain in the butt to have to overrun all these other little kingdoms. And, you know, just in, as today is in the ancient world, if you break it, you bought it. If you overthrow a king, then you're going to be responsible for uh, taking over the, the, the reign of the realm and the, 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 the new to replacing the old king with, with one of your guys. And, you know, there's no guarantee your guys are going to do any better than the old king. And it's going to be a pain to do that. And so this is a way, in effect, to use an army to amass, you know, a fairly large kingdom and great wealth with, with you know, minimal bloodshed and minimal effort and without having to go to the trouble of conquering and subduing local populations. So this was a fairly common arrangement in uh, the ancient world. And, and as we know, it's, it's a fairly common one in the ancient Near East. Now, what's interesting is that the book of Deuteronomy portrays the Deuteronomic covenant in exactly this way. I mean, keep, keep in mind, these covenants were not invented by the Bible. Covenants already existed in the ancient world, and the relationship between Israel and God is being described in analogous terms to a covenant. In other words, to, to these arrangements that already existed. And so that's a little bit surprising, isn't it, that God would take on the role of a suzerain and Israel would take on the role of a vassal. We don't think of God as being a mafia chieftain who's in effect leaning on subordinates for, for protection. And indeed, that's not quite exactly the, 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 the slant I want to provide to you when we look at this. The way to think of this is this. Uh, there's much more distance in this kind of a relationship. It's a formal arrangement now between God and Israel. 
there's not really a close buddy-buddy friendship. It's not quite as intimate as the relationship was at Sinai where Moses got to go up the mountain and see God and then communicate God's love and, to, and, and God's law to the whole people um, you know, amidst all these, these fireworks and smoke and clouds and, and wonderful fanfare and fireworks and you know, this real, real dramatic theophany. Uh, there's nothing like that in Deuteronomy. It's a much, much more of a kind of a removed business transaction. So, that, so there is distance, in effect, between the suzerain and the vassal, and that's in some way underscores the idea of Israel's sinfulness. Israel has, in effect, already declined significantly from the spiritual condition that she had been in, um, even when God had removed her, uh, ransomed her out of, of, of Egypt. So the basic idea here is that there's distance between the two parties. But of course, what's God really interested in here? He's not interested in tributes. He's not interested in cash. He's not interested in money. Ultimately, he's not really even interested in power because he already has infinite amounts of that. What he's ultimately interested in is love. And this is the final requirement of Deuteronomy, that Israel loved the Lord with all her heart, all her soul, and all her strength. And if she doesn't do that, what's going to happen? Well, ultimately, God's going to come in and force her out and ultimately replace her in the land with another people. And so you see here that the suzerain vassal uh, agreement is a very, very uh, distinct kind of, kind of an agreement, kind of a covenant from the grant covenant that we saw with Abraham, where God is unconditionally promising to give the people something. He's going to, through Abraham, bless the nations. Okay, this is God's job to do this. It's not ultimately dependent on Abraham. It's not ultimately dependent on Isaac or Jacob. It's not ultimately dependent on anything that they do or don't do or on their future fidelity or lack of fidelity. Not so the Deuteronomic covenant. The Deuteronomic covenant ultimately is going to only go as well as the vassal's ultimate behavior. Because if the vassal screws up, the suzerain will have to come in and set the vassal to rights, knock the vassal out, and put other people in, in place. And that's the idea. That's kind of the key takeaway from all this, that the Deuteronomic Covenant is conditional. It's conditional on Israel's fidelity. The Abrahamic Covenant is a grant covenant. It functions kind of like an inheritance. It's guaranteed only by the credibility of the guarantor. And there's no one in the world more credible than God, particularly when God has sworn that he will do something by an oath, even putting himself, his own very life, on the line to bring it about. Deuteronomy is, is contingent. The Abrahamic promise is definite. And this is, of course, the great drama of salvation history. You've got, on the one hand, God promising to do something. You've got, in the other, with, with the people, Israel. You've got, on the other hand, this people, Israel, who... God's ability to meet his first promise is in a way by the second covenant, the Deuteronomic covenant, is going to be contingent on that people's fidelity, which never comes. The people are not faithful. So the question is, how is God going to resolve this contradiction? Working out that contradiction is at the very heart of the Pauline gospel, for one thing, and exactly how this all plays out in salvation history. So before we talk more about that, I want you to understand the basic drama here. You've got two covenants, the Grant Covenant, the Suzerain Vassal Covenant. There's a tension between the two of them, and it's hard, impossible, in effect, to work out the, the tension or the contradiction between the two of them. And that's going to be something that God will figure a way to do in the New Testament through Jesus Christ. Okay, good. Well, I will see you.